Welcome back to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Time for us to head straight to our second conversation. Now we will be looking at the federal government's restricting airlines from the United Kingdom, Canada, Saudi Arabia. And uh, to help us understand the dynamics surrounding all of this, Elitrus Amadou will be joining the conversation. Good morning, Elitrus Amadou. Good morning. All right, uh, so, so let's just get straight to the crux of the conversation. Now, we remember that uh, not too long ago, uh, the United Kingdom put Nigeria in that red list. I mean, if you look at the entire continent, Africa was almost represented. And if you want to begin to compare the number of countries that have actually had the cases of uh, the Omicron variant, uh, some of them were not on the red list. And that has generated a lot of conversation within the continent and also in Nigeria. Now, some persons, on the other hand, also said, well, the federal government should also be looking at retaliating uh, this particular gesture. And uh, not long again, we have actually seen the government retaliating. You also have people saying, this is totally unnecessary. It is uncalled for. And uh, why should we be acting at this point in time, knowing that we are a developing nation and we understand the dynamics of losing all of these persons coming into our country? But I'd like to share your thoughts on that. First, what do you make of the ban, uh, you know, restricting or the restriction by the federal government? Well, uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, I think uh, um, there's a it's the whole thing is uh, connected with the the new wave of the COVID virus, which is the Omicron uh, variant. Um, I want to align myself with other international players who have called for caution in uh, in the ban of uh, international operations into countries like IATA has warned because the industry is barely uh, coming out of a difficult situation after the first second wave of COVID and we're in the process of recovery. So uh, bans of this nature without uh, actual empirical or scientific, scientific data uh, to prove that uh, the, the measures that have been put in place for the first and second wave to combat the first and second wave are insufficient. Uh, in the absence of that, I think uh, the ban is more of a knee-jerk uh, approach response to issues of uh, international <laughs> like this. Uh, for me, uh, Nigeria is merely reacting to, uh, uh, I think, what it felt uh, unfair international diplomacy uh, by uh, the, those nations that have banned uh, uh, flight operations from Nigeria into their own territories. So, uh, but uh, if we were to look at it objectively, uh, aero politics aside, we should be uh, um, driven by data, uh, scientific data, uh, rather than uh, this knee-jerk approach to the management of the current crisis. So um, um, what would be the implication of all of this now uh, to our economy? Well, I, it's a very sad situation because uh, you know we are uh, in a very peak period of operations as the December period, people will be traveling all over the globe, uh, into and out of, out of the country. Uh, they are the ones to bear the brunt of this decision. Uh, because uh, you can imagine a lot of them might have fixed their flights several months back for this period. And with the current ban, uh, let me speak uh, about uh, the situation between uh, Nigeria and uh, the United Arab Emirates. You know the market size of uh, um, Emirate Airlines. Uh, it's a big uh, size chunk of the market it uh, currently occupies. And uh, they, like I said, they, with this current ban, it's going to be very difficult for a lot of Nigerians who are scheduled to come home to make it this December. So uh, for me, it's a minus to the economy <laughs> that's in, on the brink. 
uh, in the cost of recovery, minus to the industry, and uh, would cause uh, irreparable damage to the traveling public. All right, Elitras, uh, like you rightly said, in the wake up of the COVID-19 and all of that, uh, one sector of the economy that came crashing literally from the skies uh, is um, the aviation sector in 2020. You know, it was really, really down completely. Aviation is supposed to stay afloat and fly above. Uh, that's just to put it literally. But then again, from what we understand here right now, you know, before now, before this uh, particular uh, development, uh, we saw UK flight, you know, coming into Nigeria. Nigeria. Did they really have enough moral grounds or right to actually fly the airlines into Nigeria uh, when they actually uh, had restricted um, Nigeria? Well, uh, you must know that this flight operations is regulated by the existing bilateral air services agreement between Nigeria and the respective states, including the UAE. Um, for me, uh, I think there's something happening that is uh, outside of the norm. Uh, when there are issues uh, connected with the implementation of the BASA, usually there's a clause there in the agreement that uh, makes for states, one state, to call for discussions uh, with a view to uh, resolving that particular problem. But uh, here we are, uh, it's a BASA issue, and uh, states are taking positions uh, that are outside the prescriptions of uh, the BASA with regards disputes uh, settlement. So um, for me, it's a BASA issue. And if you read the letter, the Emirates wrote to Nigeria, the Nigerian authorities, uh, they referred, they did state there in that this is a BASA, uh, it's an issue that they thought uh, is within the BASA framework and that uh, mechanisms are there in for the resolution. But uh, here we are, they were the ones that first started res respecting uh, air peace uh, uh, to making one flight into Dubai. And uh, they are the ones uh, now uh, resorting to uh, uh, mechanisms within the BASA for dispute resolution. But that's, that, that's a head start. It's a very important uh, letter they wrote. Uh, so that my mind is that uh, we should leverage on that letter and uh, open up discussions with uh, the UAE authorities with a view to resolving this problem. All right. Uh, you have mentioned that Nigeria is just merely reacting mm -hmm. and we shouldn't have, uh, you know, taken that position uh, by restricting airlines from those countries to Nigeria. Uh, but what approach do you think Nigeria should have taken or should take? I mean, being that this actually came first, you know, from those countries. Um, yeah, let me put, uh, put it in perspective. I didn't say Nigeria was wrong in reacting. I did say uh, these countries, other countries started first. Uh, rather than follow the normal channel for resolving issues of this nature, it started by placing ban on Nigerian airlines, which Nigeria to which Nigeria responded. So um, I'm not saying Nigeria did, did wrong. Uh, we we have a duty to protect our airlines, uh, to uh, give them every necessary support to 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 fly to whatever destinations they are designated to operate under the buses. Uh, um, what I think is that what I'm saying essentially is that decisions of this nature should not be taken uh, without scientific proof. Uh, there are, there are well laid out measures uh, internationally for operations of airlines under COVID. And uh, I have not seen any a publication nobody has come out to tell the world that the measures that have already been put in place are not enough or that the omicron variant is uh, resistant to the measures that have been put in place i.e you must have a pcr negative to fly or you are fully vaccinated uh two uh, you must use hand sanitizers you must use face mask uh, while on board the aircraft uh, um, and uh, several uh, health uh, um, 
measures that other health measures that have been in place unless this is proven to be uh, inefficient or inadequate in addressing the new variant i think states shouldn't have taken up the 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 positions they have taken uh, now this is the root cause of the problem and uh, i think uh, it's high time uh, in view of the calls from IATA and other international airline organizations for states to sit back and review their their pronouncements uh, in the interest of uh, the development of uh, international civil aviation. Because if we don't do that, I can assure you, this is going to affect the industry, global aviation industry, in a negative. All right, Amado, let's look at this um, holistically, uh, just uh, putting the aviation industry in perspective. Don't you think uh, with all of this development, it's high time Nigeria you know, reviewed some of this pact, uh, the ministerial pact, for instance, uh, with all that is happening, you know, with uh, the Emirates airline and of course airpiece and all of that, you know, when we don't have like equal, well, if I have to put it right, or carriage, uh, you know, entry into Nigeria and, uh, you know, to their country, because most times we seem to, uh, to be under their beck and call when they are not giving us a commensurate, uh, commensurate you know, rights like we deserve. Don't you think it's high time some of this pact are reviewed? For right, from all we know now, this particular uh, uh, ministerial uh, uh, approval granted Emirates um, has been taken away. So what do we do going forward? Yeah, Justin, um, I, I think uh, if you look at the bilaterals uh, deeply, uh, there's this thing that a lot of commentaries that Nigeria had aired in granting these nations the respective frequencies they have under the BASAS. I think that is incorrect because the BASAS are reciprocal, what is based on reciprocity. Whatever they give to us, we give to them. Now, the problem has been this. We've been able, we've been unable as a nation to develop or evolve strong airlines to utilize the bilateral rights. And once there are no airlines from the Nigerian side consummating these buses, what you do as a state, you create excess load factor on the foreign carrier that is doing its own, consummating its own rights. And the, that, that in essence, uh, creates a problem because most of those who are traveling are Nigerians. In the absence of the reciprocal flights, are you going to stop the other carrier from, from coming or asking for additional frequencies? And this, this request for additional frequencies are scientific. In air transport economics, the, the fact of the matter is that once the once an airline is averaging 70, 80, 85 percent load factor, there's a tendency that is doing full flights most of the times. And when they come asking for additional frequencies, you have to grant. You are under obligation to grant because it is your, your, your people who are traveling. And you, the fact is that you don't have any airline to do this reciprocal flights. You, you re recall that um, Virgin uh, Nigeria started the, the Dubai flights and stopped. Uh, Emirates, uh, um, uh, even uh, I think Arik started and stopped. The reason is that if you are not fully prepared in terms of a fully grown airline with, with uh, 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 commercial uh, arrangements with other airlines like coach uh, interlines and other things i can assure you the middle east routes are not your top because these airlines the gulf carriers and other international airlines that operate through that route have network of arrangements and you cannot be doing point to point from lagos to dubai and expect to have a good size of the traffic because most Nigerians who pass through that route are either businessmen uh, who go to Asia Pacific, buy their cargo, their goods, they, they put them on board the airline straight to Lagos. Would you want a Nigerian to buy his uh, stuff 
uh, and uh, come to Dubai, stop in Dubai and put and, and then fly a Nigerian carrier. I think it is not feasible. So we need to do a lot. And this is high time for us to invest in uh, strong national airlines, uh, uh, whether flag carriers or national carriers as it were. And it has become more uh, challenging with the, with the signing of AFTA and SATIM. Uh, SATIM has today, uh, when fully implemented, would open our skies fully like the open, it's an African variant of the Open Skies Agreement. There wouldn't be any restrictions. There wouldn't be any capacity restri restrictions. You can designate as many airlines as you, you can as a state. Uh, they, they, uh, we, they, they, the markets become a common single domestic market for all carriers. So I think our the challenge before Nigerian carriers or Nigeria as a state is to invest or create that enabling environment for strong airlines to evolve, uh, to be able to compete with their international counterparts. There has been calls that uh, airlines should, be, should merge. Uh, the, the, the laws do not allow NCA to, to coerce airlines into mergers. Mergers are regulated by other uh, entities set up by law in Nigeria. So, and, and usually you, 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 you force mergers when, there are, when airlines are on the stock exchange market and they are not performing very well. You, you now step in to intervene to get them to, to, to uh, come together to be stronger so that uh, uh, investors' monies do not go down the drain. So how many of our airlines today are on the stock market? And even those that have gone to the stock market, how have they fared? So I think our problem is more of a, a national issue than, uh, than uh, blaming the, the international air carriers for the frequencies uh, that have, they presently operate into Nigeria. There's another issue we should look at, the conflict of laws. Uh, which is impeding the flow of FDIs into our sector, uh, the aviation industry. Uh, the NIPC Act makes says uh, a foreigner can own a business 100% in Nigeria, uh, but the sectoral legislation like the Civil Aviation Act says for you to do business uh, in Nigeria as an airline, majority stake should be held by Nigerians or its nationals by Nigeria or its nationals. Now, the, the question is that how many people have the deep cost to invest in airline business? Are they ready to do that? Do we have the capacity? Uh, considering what the experience in the industry today. So we need to review some of these laws so that we can encourage uh, foreign direct uh, investment into our nation because these are some of the laws, legislations that are restricting the entry of capital for investment in our sector in Nigeria. So, um, um, with all of this now, uh, what would you say is the effect on, I mean, the effect of ticketing and orders in the aviation sector? Ticketing is, a, I think, is a product. <clears throat> It's a product, and uh, the regime of ticketing in Nigeria is deregulated. Uh, the authorities do not regulate tickets. Uh, but then I think what, what All right, uh, we seem to um, have lost um, what the <laughs> yeah, Elitros. Uh, want to Hello, Elitros, if you can hear you us. Should, uh, yeah, basically, the question would be, uh, since the whole travel restriction, now, what um, has been the multiply effect uh, as regards um, ticketing and, of course, all the you know, uh, value chain that has to do with um, aviation, since most people are actually stranded uh, you know, here in Nigeria, and, of course, those who should have been coming to Nigeria for transactions? Oh, oh I, get, I get you now. So uh, the, the, the fact is that, like I said, it is the passengers, the Nigerian passengers, those who have scheduled their flights into Nigeria within this period that would bear the brunt. Uh, you know, it's a it's a supply and demand thing. Where the mark, where the supply is, uh, the demand is higher than the supply. 
the fares would go up, and more so at this peak period. Any any airline ticket you're buying at this period certainly will be near twice the amount you would have bought before. So, and with the reduction in this uh, supply, that is the stoppage of uh, the Emirates and other uh, airlines into the, the country, you know, the, 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 the supply, the size of the airlines coming into the country would shrink. So certainly it would affect airfares uh, at this period, regrettably. Mm. So with all of this restriction, uh, do you think that we have lost money in terms of revenue and how much have we lost or how much are we going to lose? Of course, we, we are losing money and we are going to lose money until this situation is restored. Recall that Emirates has not been flying into Nigeria for some time. Uh, for each flight that comes in, there are lots of uh, uh, payments uh, that are made to relevant authorities landing, parking, handling, ground handling charges, uh, air navigation charges, uh, ticket sales charge, and all this. So uh, you can imagine uh, with the stoppage of these operations, uh, the industry uh, regulator and uh, service providers would, uh, would uh, feel the brunt uh, in the negative. Um, so uh, for me, Hello, Elitris, can you hear us? Uh, a lot would be lost uh, in three charges that would have come to, to the, air, uh, the airline and other... Uh, okay, uh, can we actually uh, estimate? Can we put a figure to it? Can we estimate any figure? Well, I, I don't want to play with figures because, you know, the industry is in a recovery state. Most of the airlines are just... Uh, uh, throttling to capacity uh, uh, after the the, the negative uh, the reduction of flights uh, over time. So I I I don't think I am in a position to to play with any figures here. All right, let's still talk about um, you know what we have as per capacity uh, COVID nineteen uh, you know arrivals departure you know as we round off this particular you know session. COVID-19 has been around for over a year, and uh, indeed, uh, like I said before, the aviation industry actually came crashing you know, last year. So far, how would you say we have done vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know, uh, protocols uh, for our arrivals, uh, departure, you know, bearing in mind um, the, the pandemic, and so far, how would you say we've done? Well, uh, let me say uh, Nigeria has done very well. Uh, uh, in fact, Nigeria was recorded to be the first African country to, to put together um, a protocol, detailed protocol for the combat of COVID-19 uh, virus. Um, in fact, uh, Nigeria got recommendation from ICAO Nigeria, uh, the regulatory authority has, uh, has uh, gotten several recommendations and awards for <laughs> sterling performance in the management of the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, for me, the protocols, if you look at uh, recently, the Civil Aviation Authority published um, new protocols for arrivals and departures from Nigeria. Basically, there's nothing new. It's still the same old uh, uh, protocols that have been placed, that have been reinforced. Uh, the only new addition is that uh, there are, there's an option as to some jurisdictions. If you, have, uh, if you are fully vaccinated, you may not need a PFTR. Uh, other jurisdictions would require uh, a negative PCR plus uh, evidence of full vaccination for departing uh, passengers. And uh, the new, the, on the other side, the protocols that were, were relaxed in regards arrivals have been reinstated. So when you arrive, you have to go through quarantine uh, and do another test before you can be allowed to I mean, uh, um, come out of isolation. 
All right. Don't you think uh, Nigeria should take um, uh, maybe uh, uh, the civil aviation sector that these are still on, uh, you know, arrivals? Because most times we've had cases of when Nigerians travel abroad, and uh, despite the fact that they present um, a COVID and vaccine certificates, they are still, uh, you know, required, you know, to. Uh, quarantine for some days before they could actually get into the main flow of the state. But as a school of thought believes that in Nigeria, it's as though that um, whatever you come with, uh, you just be allowed um, entry without uh, you know requisite uh, tests and um, all the you know requirements. Uh, what are your thoughts, really? I I think that is incorrect. Uh, I don't want to make generalization on this issue. Um, you know, Nigeria is associated with everything that is negative. But I can assure you that the authorities are, are doing their best to ensure that uh, they keep the, the, the sky safe in terms of a, a reduction of the spread of COVID to the barest minimum. Uh, I can share with you a personal experience. I went to one of the labs to do a test because I needed to travel. Uh, just recently, and uh, I met some passenger who came there that he was denied uh, uh, the right to board because they found that uh, his test, the code on his uh, results did not uh, uh, did not uh, pass through their system. So uh, it's incorrect to say to make a generalization that uh, people just come in and out without going through the necessary protocols. However. There have been reported cases that uh, of uh, some untoward practices by some of the authorities, which I believe the government has taken uh, um, uh, adequate measures to to ensure that uh, only passengers who fulfil the requirements for entry and exit are allowed to to come in and fly as it were. So uh, for me, the measures are working, uh, and uh, we want to encourage Nigerians to be patriotic. So you don't have to go and forge uh, travels uh, a negative PCR because you want to travel. Uh, you should be able to subject yourself to the necessary examination before you head to the airport to fly. All right, uh, we must say a very big um, thank you to you. We have been speaking about uh, restriction, red list, and of course, Omicron, uh, the fate of um, Nigeria's um, aviation um, industry. And we were joined by Elitros Amado. He's the president of Air Transport Services Senior Staff Association of Nigeria. We do appreciate your time, Mr. Amado. Thank you, Justin, and good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. All right, it's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. We'll take a quick break away from aviation. We'll be focusing on the Electoral Act Amendment Bill, with reports uh, saying that the president has actually refused signing that return back to the National Assembly. In a moment, uh, do join us again.